Okay, okay, okay. Hopefully you were able to get a pretty good mental list going of what you think God says about love, sex, and dating. So let me ask you real quick, how much of what you think you know did you go and read for yourself? I mean, that's a great question, right? Because here's what I know to be true, no matter what. You need to explore this stuff for yourself. What I'm about to tell you, don't just blindly trust me. Like, get a Bible, look it up in the Bible app or on your phone, and, and spend some time actually reading this stuff for yourself and study it for yourself. You shouldn't just blindly believe what anybody tells you on this topic. Not your friends, your older cousin, the people on TV, and the movies and magazines, or even me. So, let me tell you what a few of the most common myths are that people have when it comes to what God says about love, sex, and dating. See if any of these were on your list of things you thought were true too. So, myth number one. Sex is dirty and sinful. Not true. God invented sex. He could have made a lot of other ways for people to reproduce if populating the earth was the only goal. He didn't have to make it fun or enjoyable, but he did. Sex is a gift, and sex is good when it's used the way God designed it. So what way is that? Well, you may have heard before that God designed sex to happen inside a marriage relationship. Have you ever wondered why that is? I mean, why does it matter if you're married or not when you have sex? It, Here's what's actually really cool about it. Back when God's instructions were written down and recorded, there was a whole lot of stuff that people didn't know. No one knew anything about the systems in our bodies and how they work or even all the different structures like cells. I mean, science was pretty much non-existent. But, but as science has grown and we learn more and more about our bodies and how they function, science is giving us explanations for a lot of the things that God gave us instructions about. I mean, it's really quite amazing. L let me give you an example. In Genesis 2, 24, God says this, That's why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two will become one. Now, you may read that and think, well, that's just a metaphor, right? Two becoming one, sure, sure, sure. Sounds like God is just trying to be a buzzkill. But that's not really true. Science is proving God has the right idea, which makes sense because he created both us and sex. He's the expert. So when we have sex, there's a hormone released called oxytocin. Now, oxytocin, science tells us, is a neurotransmitter that impacts bonding behavior. You should look it up. Oxytocin isn't only released during sex. You want to guess when another example of when it's released? After childbirth. After a woman gives birth, her body releases oxytocin. Why, why would that be? Remember, this hormone impacts bonding behavior. For a new mom, it's what bonds her to her newborn baby so she doesn't abandon it or kill it like some animals do. I mean, in the same way, when we have sex with someone, oxytocin is released, bonding us to that person. Regardless of how connected we felt to them beforehand, suddenly we're attached. We are one. Uh, you have seen a couple together, and it's obvious that they shouldn't still be together. They're bad together, they're not compatible, whatever, but they just can't seem to break it up, even though it's clearly a dysfunctional dating relationship, right? And oftentimes, it's because there's sex involved. Because of how God designed our bodies to function, the way he created sex to work is to bond us together anytime we do it. That's part of why God says only do this inside of marriage because going around being bonded to lots and lots of people isn't going to lead you to, to a good life. It's going to make things difficult for you, more complicated, more painful. It's going to hurt you in the long run. But if you use sex the way God's telling you to, the way it was designed to be used, it'll be amazing because it'll keep you and your husband or wife together and connected. So there's a whole lot more science out there to support this stuff that I don't have time to get into, but the point is that you can trust God's design because he made it with you in mind. So let's tackle another myth. Myth number two, sex is only for procreation. Procreation just means making people so as a species we can continue to exist. And guys, that's the big old no. God created sex. He did just make it to keep our species alive, though. There, there are actually three purposes that God designed sex to have, and they all conveniently begin with the letter P. Procreation, pleasure, and promise. Procreation, yes, part of sex is keeping the earth repopulated. But again, God could have chosen a lot of different ways to repopulate the earth if procreation was the only goal, but it wasn't. So, number two, pleasure. I would, I would be dumb to stand here and tell you sex is not fun. Like, God designed sex to be enjoyable. He made it that way. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but all the things that make sex great were all created by God. But God also planned from the beginning for us to be practicing sex inside a marriage relationship because He knew the best sex happens when you're with someone you trust and feel safe with. Someone who will be there for you and with you when sex is over. Someone who has made a commitment to you, right? 
Which brings us to the third purpose God intended for sex, promise. God's plan for sex was that it would be a constant reminder of our commitment to each other in marriage and a bonding time. Remember oxytocin? It creates a sense of connection and closeness to each other. In Matthew 19, 6, Jesus says this, they, meaning a husband and wife he's talking about, are no longer two but one. So no one should separate what God has joined together. Now, why do you think Jesus said that? I mean, once again, science gives us a little insight into how perfect God's original plan was. Science is proving the more sexual partners a person has, the less able they are to connect with a future partner. I mean, listen to this. Research from the Medical Institute for Sexual Health goes on to illustrate the importance of oxytocin when it comes to pair bonding. They, they say this, casual sex leads to a decrease in this neurochemical production and it interferes with further pair bonding. So here's what it means. Repeated sexual encounters with multiple partners, it neutralizes your brain. Going outside of God's design for sex actually impacts your ability to have great sex later. See, you can trust God's design because he made it with you in mind. God created sex to be good, and he knows the best sex happens when you follow his plan for it to happen inside of a marriage relationship. There are a lot of voices out there. They're going to try and tell you something completely different. But what God said, science is backing up. And you can trust God's design because he made it with you in mind. Now, you might be wondering about the single most asked question in every church student ministry ever. If sex is best inside a marriage relationship, how far is too far when we're dating? Jared, let's just say I agree that to trust God's design for sex because I know he made it with me in mind. Uh, that's all fine and good. Great, great, great. Sex is now off limits. But um, what about other stuff? Kissing? hand-holding, other stuff. And what about dating, flirting, boyfriend, girlfriend things? All of that, okay? I, really great questions. And I'm going to leave you hanging out there on those questions for a whole week because next week, Matt is going to come back to answer all those questions and wrap up this series. It's complicated. But for today, take some time. Talk with your group. All the stuff we talked about today. Maybe start by sharing if you learned anything new today. Had you ever heard some of the myths we talked about and not realized that they were untrue? Like, what do you think about the truth about God's design for sex? Talk about that with your group. Be sure to come back next week as Matt wraps up part three of this series.